Hello, I am Jake Collins, and this is Nightmare Series 6, Episode 6, which was first broadcast on the 16th of October, 1992. We're with the third team of the series, Alan, Jim, Nick, and Mark. A rather dreary team, a very annoying team to watch in many ways. But their quest is long and eventful, and for that reason, I've always enjoyed watching it. Interestingly enough, Alan's team is one of only two non-winning teams to appear in four episodes of Nightmare. Two whole ones, and a bit either side sharing episodes with the team before them and the team after them, thus making appearances in four episodes. The other team that does that is Daniel's team in Series 8, where there's certainly time to mess around on such a long quest and then bring it to an end cruelly in Level 3. Isn't there? It's not like we've only got ten episodes to play around with or anything. This nightmare location is an interesting one. It gets used as the level two clue area four times out of seven in this series. I discovered quite by accident on holiday in North Yorkshire, that this is Helmsley Castle. And I've always liked it as a level 2 threshold entrance area, pick up some objects there. The team avoid falling into the trap here of taking the ugly potion, the Sidrus. As Alan points out in the scene that happened at the very end of the previous episode, Sidrus wants to be beautiful, having uglified herself. She doesn't want an ugly potion to make her more ugly. Here we're introduced to the Medusa Eye. In the little chest, which appears to be a Genoese box of delights. Lord Fear's plan on this level to get the better of Alan involves some of those eventful, quite memorable scenes that I was mentioning just now. Lord Fear isn't going to reveal to Scarkill the details of his plan to get Alan to look at the Medusa Eye. He's not going to reveal them to us either. And it actually takes several years for the full details of that plan to become apparent to the Nightmare community as a whole. I'll freely admit it fooled me for several years. Lord Fear's plan is not, as it at first appears, get Hordris to give them the Medusa Eye. Dressed up as Harris, the poor starving beggar. Lord Fear's plan is to dress up as Hordris, dressed up as Harris himself, and give Alan the Medusa Eye. It never did sit quite right with me that Hordress would do this for Lord Fear. Okay, he's technically non-aligned at the moment. Later in the series, Hordress seeks positive alignment with the powers that be, having been so disgusted by Lord Fear's behaviour. So at this stage, there's no 
real reason Horsgrass shouldn't be playing an antagonistic role in the quest, but actively working for Lord Fear doesn't seem like the kind of thing Horsgrass would want to be doing. And of course, it isn't. And Lord Fear's banking on that, really, by disguising himself as Horgris in disguise as Harris. He thinks Dungeoneer team will trust him, because they'll trust Horgris not to be giving them anything bad. I did start getting kind of alarm bells about the old beggarman situation in the next episode, where Sidrus mentions that she's been frozen by what appears to be an old beggarman, but was actually someone in disguise sent by Lord Fear. I always thought, well, that can't have been Hordrus, can it? Even if this is Hordrus trying to take advantage of Alan here. He's not going to be working for Lord Fear to freeze his own daughter and then be in the pool demanding her release straight afterwards. So that old beggarman can't have been Horderous, can it? Well, of course, that one was Lord Fear too, wasn't it? Just like the one in this scene. But Mark Knight's impression of... Clifford Norgate doing Hordris as Harris is so convincing. I can definitely understand why there was a lot of confusion about it. In the early days of the Nightmare Forum. Oh, of course it's not Hordris, it's Lord Fear. No, it's not Lord Fear, it's Hordris. It's about the extent of the argument. It may have gone round and round in circles, but that's about all that can ever have been to it. But yeah, that is one of Mark Knight's voices. And once you think, oh, is it Lord Fear? You can hear, ah, yes, it is Lord Fear doing an impression. It's a bit like his brother Strange impression in Series 8. Except that sounds a lot less like Brother Strange than this version of it sounds like Hordris as Harris. I mean, I always thought he hasn't quite recaptured the same voice as in Series 5 here, Clifford, but it's a very close approximation. But then realising later, of course, it's not Clifford doing it at all, it's Mark Knight doing an excellent impression of that Harris voice from Series 5. So now it all makes perfect sense. Lord Fear himself is giving the Medusa eye to Alan. It's the only thing that really ever could have made sense. I suppose really the first doubt I had was that in this episode, Clifford Norgate is credited as Dreadnought. And I used to think, well, why isn't he credited as Hordrus? Hordrus always makes it into the cast as a full-body character over Smirkanorf or Dreadnought. That helps to lift the veil of confusion to think, oh yeah, Dreadnought is the only role that Clifford Norgate actually plays in this episode. That character who just gave Alan the Medusa eye was Lord Fear. The rocks of Bruin, Treyguards, bigging them up there, a place of legend. We've heard about them in Simea's quest. As the way through to level three. And now Alan's finally there exploring the rocks of Bruin, looking for the way through to level three. I was talking on my previous series of commentaries about Level 3 and the caverns of gore lacking a kind of consistent identity in this series, like Winteria in Series 5. It's there as a kind of tantalising location. Ooh, here we are, this is Level 3. This is the exciting closing stages of Level 2, the Rocks of Bruin. 
but it doesn't happen consistently. You don't see other Dungeoneers coming to the rocks of Bruin after Alan and feeling those significant moments of being on the threshold to level 3. They're in different locations. It's an extension of that level 3 lacking an identity problem. And I think it does take something away from the atmosphere, the potential atmosphere that the series is trying to create with these locations. It's odd that Hegarty wants the Medusa eye, isn't it? Fair enough, it don't work on witches so she can look at it, but what on earth is she going to do with it? She just has to want it so that Alan's quest can unfold in a believable, logical way. He has to get rid of the Medusa Eye, and he has to get hold of the beauty spell for Sidrus, and that's how it's going to happen. Hegarty wants the Medusa Eye and gives Alan a beauty spell. Never quite made sense to me, that, but... Whatever, we'll go with it. Hegarty's going to have a lot of fun rushing around causing mischief with this Medusa Eye, obviously. She's not in it again until the very final episode of the series, when she has a brief conversation with Greystag through the spyglass. I don't like to use Stephanie Hess as Hegarty as we get into the second half of the series. I'm not sure why. It's a bit of a shame, really, having the regular witch character underlining the location of Witch Haven which is a consistently used and realised level 2 location, unlike the Rocks of Bruin. But speaking of being in North Yorkshire and finding these nightmare locations, Brimham Rocks, which is the real location of the Rocks of Bruin, is my least favourite nightmare location ever, and I urge you, do not go there. I've never been so annoyed by a visit to a nightmare location in my life. There are signs saying there is a toilet. There isn't one. It's very easy to get lost. There are people mucking about on the rocks and making you worry they're going to fall off. Just don't bother with it, is my advice. I always like the way their Sidrus kind of gives Alan that teasing, appraising, flirty look before running off. It's quite good fun, this kind of level of light flirting that may exist at times between Sidrus and the male Dungeoneers and a character like Rodolfo kissing the hands of the lady Dungeoneers, January and Sophia. It's a nice little touch, and it's not really inappropriate. Just adds a bit of fun to the show. And we come on now to Lord Fear's second attempt to nab Alan directly, this time by sticking his hand into the game, as he so often does at the end of Spyglass sequences in this series. I quite like to see Lord Fear's hand being used as an actual challenge here. The Lord Fear's menacing voiceover. As a chase you out of the room, scare you off, very slowly clawing its way towards you, but never getting you aspect of the show. I don't like it that much. But this scene with Alan and the hand... That's quite nice, and it makes Lord Fear very sinister and threatening. Traeguard is absolutely amazed. They thought they might be able to give Lord Fear the gauntlet to let them through. Ha! says Traeguard. No, Alan, I won't, says Lord Fear. Of course not. And as Traeguard is obviously thinking there. Well, come on, use what weapons you have. Think about it. You've got a glove. Give him a great big hand. It's not a bribe, is it? It's a weapon. A glove isn't for selling, boys. It's for using. 
In this case, it's being used to magically keep Lord Fear's hand out of the way while Alan escapes. And that reminds me of something that Paul McIntosh said about Lord Fear in The Big Issue in the Eye Shield fanzine. When it comes to the crunch, he's very easy to defeat. We think about the end of the three quests where Lord Fear is there to be defeated as the final challenge. He's magically transported into his own pool by Ben in series six. He's trapped by the Ark and Shield by Julie in series seven. He's completely scared off by Dunstan's paladin spell in series eight. We think about the ends of series five, six, and seven. He's frozen. He's squashed. Paul's right, isn't he? When it comes to the crunch, Lord Fear is very easy to defeat, and he kind of has to be, because, like all Nightmare characters, Lord Fear exists to play a role in a game. And as we get further and further into Nightmare, characters do get more kind of backstory and appear to have more life outside Nightmare, which is great fun. A great way for the audience to engage with the show, to see the realm of Nightmare as a wider world. I'm thinking about Velda and her role in Series 3 as Keeper of the Gate and Warden of the Lower Marches. It just so happens that in this role, her life is overlapping with the game of Nightmare. It's very effective world building, giving the characters these lives outside the game, working at the crazed heifer, being a merchant in Wolfenden. Having this whole evil empire that you're running in the case of Lord Fear. And that's very tantalising for the imagination. And Nightmare fans engage with it a lot, of course. But when it comes to the crunch, you get right down to the bare bones. The fact is that these characters do exist to play a role in this game. And so, when you need to be able to defeat Lord Fear, you're going to be able to without any trouble if you've done the right things to play your own game. This is a very interesting scene, and a scene that paves the way forward for Lord Fear's interactions and for spyglass sequences in future. Lissard owes his entire existence to this spyglass sequence with Scarkill and Lord Fear actually in the same room, talking to each other, if only briefly, Scarkill wandering around behind Lord Fear for a while. Tim Child and friends have realised, hey, that works really well, and we should use it more extensively later in the series. It does give an extra dimension to Lord Fear, actually having someone there to talk to in person, rather than just speaking through his crystal ball or pool of veracity, and he's going to talk to Captain Nemanor through his pool of veracity for the rest of this spyglass scene. Adds an element of threat to Alan being on the ship. Captain Nemanor is going to be on the lookout for stowaways, and if anything has crept aboard, he'll dispatch it himself. Adrian Neal makes it very clear here that Captain Nemanor doesn't like Lord Fear, but they do have a kind of tentative peace between them, a treaty. They're kind of allies in some ways, and in later appearances, Nemanor hates Lord Fear. So I always think that doesn't quite match up with this first Nemanor appearance, but. Well, it's clear that Nemanor doesn't like Lord Fear there, resents his incursion into the smooth running of the Cloud Walker, resents being told what to do by him. So, I guess that works. 
Yes, I did always like Scarkill wandering around in the background there, and I was pleased to see it used again later in the series, Ben's quest and Sophia's quest. And of course, it leads on to Scarkill being divided into two different characters when you get to the place of Series 7. Lissard, to do all that wandering around in the background, talking to Lord Fear in the Spyglass sequences, and Raptor to do Scarkill's role in the actual dungeon as Goblin Master. In many ways, I think I do prefer Scarkill in that role, performing both parts of it. And I'd rather have seen, as I've said before, Lissard doing things in the dungeon rather than just being. There in the spyglass to hang around and talk to Lord Fear. So if I'm comparing Scarkill and Lissard in a big issue kind of situation, I certainly do prefer Scarkill in that way for having both parts of that role and fulfilling them very well, very entertainingly. And I don't think splitting him up into two characters was necessarily the right thing to do. Although, as I say, as far as it goes, I do enjoy a lot of that Lord Fear and Lissard interaction through the spy glasses, and I'm very glad that that scene with Starkill leads on to that sort of thing in the future. It's just a shame that it's all Lissard really ever gets to do. You could go even further and say that the entire concept of Lord Fear's base in Marblehead with the telescreen and the lift and people wandering around there talking to him, mainly Lissard, also Sylvester Hands on one occasion, can be traced back to this episode, that scene with Scarkill as well. It reveals that Lord Fear works very well, not just as someone sitting there talking to people magically through his crystal ball or his pool, but as someone actually doing a double scene with another character. So overall, that's certainly a good development for the show. We get a tantalising glimpse here at the end of the closing music, of the samurai in the dwarf tunnels. That's obviously some sort of screen test going on with the goblins wandering around in the dwarf tunnels and then the samurai turning up at the end there. He's a strange old addition to Nightmare Series 6, the samurai. He's already appeared twice in the series as a kind of apparition, ostensibly to cause a threat to Sylvester Hands on behalf of Matt and then our walk on behalf of Julius Scaramonger. But as Sylvester Hand says, oh, I can see right through him. It's hard to see how he's actually going to cause harm to anybody. He's a kind of ghost. It would be better if he turned up as a solid samurai, as he is there in that dwarf tunnel sequence at the end of this episode. And you could command him to do your bidding, attack your enemies, rather like the Viking spell, which is featured in the Choose Your Own Adventure section of the first two Nightmare books. And then we don't see the samurai again after this point, the very, very closing stages of episode 6 of series 6. A strange addition to this series, used rather strangely, and perhaps deserves some more interesting, consistent, regular appearances. Thanks for listening to this episode commentary. Hopefully you'll join me again next time for the penultimate entry in this series of eight commentaries as I talk about Nightmare Series 7, Episode 1.